The next one to come up and tell us about their science hero is Tom Lang. Tom is a science communicator and commuter and comedian. And by day, he teaches little kids about the wonders of the universe. And by night, he tells off-colour jokes in comedy rooms around Melbourne. Sometimes he mixes up the two and everyone learns more than they expected. So please welcome Tom. Oh, hi. Oh, hello. We've got volume. Excellent. Uh, I'm, you've probably guessed, I'm the least qualified person that's going to be speaking tonight. Uh, so g'day. I have a grad dip, which is meaningless. Uh, I want to talk about, he's not really a science hero, but he's definitely somebody you should know about uh, because he just had an incredible effect on the environment. I'm going to talk about Thomas Midgley, and the way I like to imagine what he did to the world is imagine the world, like the, that shining blue dot with the environment, all fragile and precious, and then get it and leave it in a room with Mr. Bean. That's basically what Thomas Midgley did. He was a, uh, a mechanical engineer turned industrial chemist, okay? And near the start of the 20th century, he was working for General Motors, uh, who, I mean... <laughs> They generally made motors. I don't need to explain that. Uh, so he's working for General Motors, trying to find a way to stop something called engine knocking. Now, engine knocking was a big deal back when cars weren't very good and petrol wasn't very good. Basically, uh, under high pressure, petrol would explode unpredictably within the pistons of your car, causing anything from a pinging noise to full engine detonation, which is not something that you want. Uh, now, you can fix engine knocking in a couple of ways. You can drive very carefully at low power, and no one wants that. You can add a lot of ethanol to the mix. Uh, that is actually quite effective. It ups the octane level, which means you can do higher compression. Uh, now, ethanol is great. Uh, back then, they had a lot of cars that run on ethanol. The one problem with ethanol cars is you can't make a lot of money out of them. You can't patent ethanol, and anybody with a, a still and a big pile of corn can make as much as they need, okay? General Motors, not a fan of just making other people money, okay? And this being America in the 1920s, everybody had a still and a big pile of corn. <laughs> Actually, I used to live with a mechanical engineer who brewed his own ethanol, uh, just with sugar water. It was easy, uh, but that stuff probably would have been safer to put in a car than to put in us. But we were students. What can you do? Um, so, General Motors was like, Thomas Midgley, find us a way to stop knocking that makes us some money. And they tried everything. And I mean everything. Apparently thousands and thousands of different substances he put in his little test motor to see what would stop knocking. Butter, apparently he tried. Uh, iodine worked okay, but too expensive. If you left a cup of coffee on his desk, he'd probably add it just to see what would happen. Eventually, they found something that worked pretty well uh, called tetraethyl lead. Okay, tetraethyl lead friggin' destroyed knocking. It was awesome. One drop, bam, problem solved. Suddenly you've got a high compression, high power motor. And there are other bonuses because lead is very cheap. It, uh, it doesn't decay. It's a deadly neurotoxin. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. It, like lead poisoning causes hallucin hallucinations, insanity, death, um, and it's... Everybody knew this. This wasn't a secret to anyone. The ancient Greeks knew it. Uh, the people of that time knew it. Thomas Midgley was a chemist. We're pretty sure he knew it. But he was very cavalier. He took it to General Motors. He was like, guys, problem solved. General Motors was like, it's got lead in it. That's going to kill people. He was like, yep. They were like, we're fine with that. <laughs> and that's not written down, but that was the impression they gave. Uh, and so, yeah, basically they said... We're not going to bother with too much laboratory testing. We're going to just, we're going to wait and see what the industrial data is, which is code for we're going to make it and see what happens and if anything goes wrong in the world, eh, maybe we'll do something. Uh, a lot of people were very worried. The public service, uh, scientists, academics were basically saying, what are you guys doing? You can't do this. You can't put lead in the petrol. We have to breathe this. And General Motors said, I mean, you can't prove that it's wrong. Show us the evidence of how much lead it's going to put out. Yeah, you don't have it because we haven't done it yet. So stuff you guys, maybe we'll sue you. Uh, which you may recognize as the response of every big industry ever since. Um, so Thomas Midgley wasn't around at this point, actually, uh, while all this drama was going on. He was taking a little break. 
because he was suffering from lead poisoning. Uh, took a little breather down in Miami until his lungs recovered, which was a bit of a red flag in hindsight. Um, he gets his comeuppance, don't worry about it. So they put this, they, they, they didn't call it tetraethyl lead, of course, they just called it ethyl, which was a popular girl's name at the time. They very sneakily avoided mentioning lead at all in any of the advertising material, and they advertised the heck out of it, okay? Because they said tetraethyl, no, they called it ethyl. They said, put ethyl in your car, okay? It'll make your car go faster. We're inventing new cars, which can go even better. Your old car is now a new car. Ethyl, if you don't have it, everyone will think you're a sissy, was basically the marketing, which you'll recognize as the marketing for every car product ever since. Ah, oh, General Motors. Uh, so, uh, basically, yeah, they figured out we can make a lot of money out of this because one liter of tetraethyl lead will ethylite, will lead arise, will, will make anti-knocking a thousand liters of petrol. So pretty much every bit of petrol that got sold in America from then on, General Motors was making cash out of. They were making a lot of cash out of, and they were just poisoning the atmosphere with a lot of lead. And everyone knew this was bad. All the scientists were like, hey, this is bad. Let's have some conferences. Let's try and get it banned. Let's see what we can do. And nothing happened for 40 to 60 years. They kept doing this. And all the results were coming in, and kids had their bones full of lead, and there was lead everywhere, and General Motors was like, you can't really prove that any of this is wrong. But they totally could prove it. They just didn't really do anything about it. I mean, year one, year one of making this stuff, 15 people died in the factories. And they were like, they probably just worked really hard. <laughs> that, was just, that was just overworking, making them hallucinate, go crazy, and jump out of windows. That's just, we're just running a bad factory, guys. It's not a bad product. It was a bad product. Um, eventually, they stopped making it, as I'm sure you know, by being here, not crazy, without your bones full of lead. They stopped making it so much in about the 70s, General Motors sold off the company, uh, stopped making ethyl, and then brought in the catalytic converter, which doesn't work with ethyl. The catalytic, con catalytic converter and ethyl leaded petrol do not function together. So General Motors sold that off, brought in the catalytic converter, started making tons of money from that, and it really wasn't because of the whole science thing at all. It wasn't because, hey, this is killing our children, it's because, hey, we can make some money out of something else, which is a little depressing. But you know what, end result, they got rid of the lead. Lead, uh, lead in the blood and bones of the American population dropped like 75% over the next decade or so, and in fact, they've directly attributed the drop in the crime rate in the 90s to the fact that they stopped using lead in the 70s. And children who'd grown up with a lot of lead were more prone to crime, juvenile delinquency, things like that. Anyway, that's all long after Thomas Midgley's time. He died uh, a little before they, they, they realized that, how bad the lead was. Um, and it was, uh, look, he got his comeuppance. Uh, he loved to do this thing to prove that lead was safe by like washing his hands in tetraethyl lead, maybe sniffing a little bit. Um, anyway, he sorted tetraethyl lead, but he wasn't done yet. A little while later, he moved over to General Motors' refrigeration division. Now, refrigeration was having a problem at that time because it kept exploding. Everything was exploding back then. They made refrigerants out of propane, ammonia, uh, sulfur dioxide, horrible, poisonous, explosive things. And they said, Thomas Midgley, you friggin' smashed engine knocking. What can you do for the fridges? Is it deadly? Please tell us it's deadly. It wasn't. It was a perfectly harmless, non-toxic, non-reactive, fire-retardant chemical called chlorofluorocarbons. <sighs> One little downside is they destroy the ozone layer, which nobody saw coming. And they're an awful, awful greenhouse gas. So, in his short working career, Thomas Midgley invented the lead crisis. He stopped ethanol cars from being a thing. He invented CFCs, and then he died at the hands of his own invention. None of the above. He got polio at about age 50 and constructed himself a little polio rig in his bed to help him get out of, in and out of that. Four years later, he strangled himself to death with it. I think that's poetic irony. I'm not sure. It's some kind of irony. Um, 
But I think Thomas Midgley is someone worth remembering because he was just doing his job. He was just trying to solve problems. If anything, he was a pawn in these big companies' plans of making a lot of money at the expense of everybody else. Um, oh, that's a low note to end on. Uh, thank you very much.